Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson number 8, January 22nd, 2017. The lesson is entitled Praise for the Creator's Wisdom. The lesson comes from Psalms 104, verses 1 through 4 and verses 24 through 30. We were asked to read Psalms 104, verses 1 through 35. The place is Palestine. The time is unknown. The main alternative to the concept of God creating everything is the theory of evolution. It suggests that everything we see is the product of blind chance, fortuitous luck, and random chances that add up to order out of chaos and complexity out of simplicity. It takes a great leap of faith to accept evolution as fact. It would be easier to accept evolution if we began with the idea that we must rule out God or any effect he might have on the physical world if he does exist. It is sheer folly to suggest that God used evolution to produce the world as we know it because he plainly tells us he created the world, including humans, in a logical and orderly sequence. This theme runs throughout the Bible in such depth that we would have to cut out a huge percentage of the scriptures to blot out the idea. The Bible mentions creation often. We learn from John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, and many other passages that Jesus is the creator. Blind chance could not possibly have resulted in the wisdom we see all around us in the created world. Today's aim, facts, to see the wisdom of God in his work of creation. Principle, to understand that we will be better off if we accept his wisdom instead of our own. Application, to frame our approach to the realities of life and death according to God's wisdom. Illustrating the lesson. By God's wisdom, the world is created and continues to function. Practical points. One, the majesty of God leads to reverence of him. We must appropriately appropriately respond to God's greatness. Psalms 104, 1 through 4. Two, the variety and magnitude of God's creation are are on display in the world around us. God's wisdom and power call for our admiration. Verses 24 through 26. Three, it is God who provides for the survival of his creation. Psalms 104, 27 through 28, Matt 6, 26. Four, it is God who sustains and upholds the created order and who continues to renew it. The earth is the Lord's. Evolution cannot explain its origin or operation. Psalms 104, 29 through 30. Golden text. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Psalms 104, 24. Today we have two lesson outlines. One, the greatness of God, and two, the wisdom, the greatness of God coming from Psalms 104, 1 through 4, and the second is the wisdom of God's works, Psalms 104, 24 through 30. Introduction. The United States, like the Western world in general, was founded on the presupposition that the Bible is true and truly reveal God as the eternal, holy, righteous, and just creator. Yet today we find America following the religious lead of the European nations as atheism becomes more abundant in our culture, or at least louder and public expressions of Christianity are increasingly banned in the name of protecting some poor soul from being offended. The change did not happen overnight. Indeed, it seems the devil understands that outright denial of God's existence must be built on a long-term strategy that begins with subtle yet systematic attacks on the foundation of our faith. This is why he indoctrinates people with the evolutionary claim that all creation, including human beings, is purely the natural result of random chemical reactions. 
Thus, God does not exist or at least is considerably less than what the Bible reveals him to be. As Christians, we cannot allow the winds of culture to erode our view of God and thus rob him of the praise due him. The Bible fully reveals who God is. The greatness of God. Psalms 104, 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Verse 2. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment? Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain? Verse 3. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters? Who maketh the clouds his chariot? Who walketh upon the winds of the wings of the wind? Verse 4. Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire? Many commentaries have uh, have observed that Psalms 104 presents a poetic view of the creation recorded in Genesis 1. In fact, the structure of the psalm is modeled fairly closely on that of Genesis 1, taking the stages of creation as starting points for praise. The author of Psalms 104 is not given, but it begins and ends exactly as does Psalms 104, a devatic psalm, so it quietly likely was composed by David. Revealed in his character, Psalms 104, 1 through 2a, like so many of the psalms in this section of the book, 95 through 96, 98, 100, 103, 105 through 106, Psalm 104 begins with a call to praise the Lord. To bless the Lord is to praise him with the distinctive emphasis being on grateful praise. Soul simply refers to the person or self in this context. While the psalm was written to be sung corporately, the emphasis is on the individual's participation in praise. Like the psalmist, we need to remind ourselves frequently to praise God. The Lord is to be praised because of how great he is. The following phrases picture this greatness. The Lord is clothed in honor and majesty, and he wraps himself in a robe of light. The Lord is presented as the king, and the image is of him clad in royal garments. The terms speak of his splendor, but also of his beautiful and attractive character. The fact that he puts on these attributes suggests that his character is displayed in his outward actions. Light was the first of God's creations and the initial creation of the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1 and 3. The picture presents God as separate from his creation, but closely identified with it. Revealed in his dwelling, Psalms 104, 2, B through 3. God's greatness is then highlighted in four successive phrases. First, he is the one who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. The word for curtain here refers to a tent. So while the phrase speaks of how the Lord created the visible heavens as easily as one constructs a tent, he also speaks of the heavens as his indwelling place. Second, the Lord is the one who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Psalms 104.3 Chambers is more literally roof chambers, like those that were built on the roofs of houses to take advantage of evening breezes during the summer heat. The beams of the chambers, however, rest on the waters. In the creation context, these are the waters above the feminine. Genesis 1, 6 through 7. He was like a builder making a private room by laying the foundation beams above the waters of the sky. The third description of God is of how the clouds serve as his chariot, and the fourth depicts him riding on the wind as if it had wings. These highly poetic pictures present the Lord as master of heaven and ruler over nature. They clearly contrast him with the false god Baal of the ancient Near East who was believed to control rain and fertility and was described as the rider of the clouds. Revealed in his servants, Psalms 104, 4. 
Finally, the Lord, who is to be praised, maketh his angel spirits. His ministers are a flaming fire. The wording is difficult to understand, and it is complicated by the fact that the word for angels simply means messengers, and spirits can also mean wind. Some take the verse to mean that God makes the wind his messengers and the fire his ministers. Hebrews 1 7, however, quotes the verse with reference to angels. Based on the Hebrews quotation, it seems the meaning is that God makes his angels like the winds and his ministers and other reference to angels like fire. The angels who serve the Lord are indeed powerful and impressive in appearance. It is true that they cannot compare to God the Son, but the fact that they, these exalted beings serve the Lord further emphasizes his greatness. To remind ourselves to bless or praise the Lord is to also remind ourselves of his greatness. Let us recall often that he is the creator, the one who stands above his creation in majesty and honor, the one who rules his creation as master, and the one who is honored and served by the mighty angels. The wisdom of God's works. Verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are thy works, in wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Verse 25. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great. Verse 26. There go the ships that they leveth on, whom thou hast made to play therein. Verse 27. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. Verse 28, that thou givest them, they gather, thou openest thine hand, and thy are filled with good. Verse 29, thou hidest thy face, they are troubled, thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. Verse 30, thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. His work of creation, Psalms 104, 24 through 26. Verses 5 through 23 detail various aspects of God's creation. Reviewing the distinction between made between the land and the seas and describing the rain, God brings to the trees and the vegetation and the role of the sun and the moon in God's plan. Before going on to cite other specifics of God's creation, the psalmist stopped to marvel at the great number and extent of the Lord's work. The vast number and variety of God's creative works revealed the Lord's wisdom. It was in wisdom that all of them were made, the psalm, the psalm proclaims. Wisdom can refer simply to skill, but more is involved in creation than mere skill. God's understanding, discretion, and omniscience are all part of his wisdom, which is revealed especially in his work of creation. Proverbs 8, 1 through 4, 27 through 31, Jeremiah 10, 12. So many are the mighty works of God that Psalms 104 declares, the earth is full of thy riches, verse 24. Riches can refer to either possessions or creatures. Certainly both ideas are true. The earth is filled with the creatures God made and everything in the world belongs to him. Verses 20, book 24, chapter 1. This is a reminder of our solemn responsibility as stewards of all that God has entrusted to us. Things on earth are not ours to use as we please. They belong to God, and we are to use them to please him. Psalms 104.25 turns to more of God's creations that display his great wisdom, namely the sea and all the creatures that inhabit it. The sea is a great and wide. Wide speaks more of its size. Great, which picks up on the great scene in verse 1, emphasizes its importance and impressiveness. Which sea 
is in view here. While the Sea of Galilee was very important to the economy of the northern part of Israel, the Israelite author of the psalm almost certainly had the Mediterranean Sea in mind. This sea was the only large body of water accessible to most Israelites that could be described in terms used here. One could look out over the wide Mediterranean and see nothing but water, but in it were creatures beyond number, both small and large. The creeping creatures are those that seem to glide along and so could describe any number of animals. The incredible variety in God's creation is especially evident in the sea, where tiny creatures swam side by side with the largest animals on earth. The authors seemed struck by the fact that the sea that carried the great ships and their cargo from one point to another also served as the home to living creatures as large or larger than those ships. The man-made vessels are introduced in Psalms 104:26 only as a means of exalting the greatness of God. Leviathan refers broadly to a large aquatic animal. A whale may be in mind, though some have argued that Leviathan was a sea-dwelling dinosaur. His work of providence, Psalms 104, 27 through 30. Theologians use the term providence to refer to God's power in bringing the movement of the universe to its predetermined goal and design. God's providence is evidence in the way he provides for the sustenance of all creation, including the sea creatures mentioned in verses 25 through 26. The creatures of the sea, the psalmist said, wait all upon the Lord to, for him to give them their meat in due season, Psalms 104, 27. The thought here is that the fish and other sea creatures are totally dependent on the Lord to provide for them and he faithfully provides in due season or the appointed time. He regularly provides what is needed at the time it is needed. The waiting of the creatures of the sea points to their dependence on God, but they do not wait in the sense of doing nothing to obtain their food. They gather the food he provides, and they do so without comprehending that it is coming from him. Yet the Lord is the one who gives it from his open hand and they have and they are satisfied the psalmist illustrated god's providence with regard to the vast amount of sea life but he is providentially at work in all of his creation including mankind while fallen sinful people like to think that they are the masters of their own fate and can care for themselves. In reality, all people are dependent on God's sustaining power and, and provision for their existence and continuing existence in this world. As the Apostle Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28. This is true whether people acknowledge the Lord's provision or not. However, if we understand this truth, and as Christians, we clearly should. We will acknowledge the Lord and his greatness, and we will praise him for all our being. Psalms 104, 29 through 30 reinforces God's providence by pointing to his control over the life and death of the creatures of the sea. If he chooses to hide his face from them, the animals are troubled or disturbed. To hide one's face is an idiomatic expression that means to withhold favor. Psalms 113.1 When God hides his face from creatures, they are indeed in trouble. Likewise, if the Lord chooses to take away their breath, they die. Psalms 24 Psalms 104:29. This stands parallel to the previous line, but is much more specific. The Hebrew word translated breath can also be translated spirit. However, it is understood in this context, it refers to life being taken away. Any creature whose breath or spirit is taken away dies, and that one's body decomposes and returns to dust, Genesis 3.19. 
All living things live because God has put life and breath in them. When he takes this away, they die. Thus, they are utterly dependent on him. Psalms 104.30 focuses not on death, but on the life God gives to his creatures in the first place. When he sends forth his spirit, they are created. Spirit is the same word translated as breath in verse 29. This makes it clear that God is the one who gives life to all living things. Without him, they would not be created. In Genesis 1:21, we read that God created all sea life. The same Hebrew word is used in Psalms 104:30. Yet here the idea does not seem to be that God is constantly creating new life, but rather that he is providentially working to see that life continues. As some of the sea creatures die, new ones are born. Each generation is succeeded by another. For the Lord in his wisdom has established this cycle and he, prov he provides what is needed for it to continue. This is explained in the final words of our text. It is by God's plan that the earth is renewed in this way, for he continually gives new, fresh life with each new generation of his creatures. While the psalmist spoke of God's wise providence in reference specifically to the living beings found in the sea, it applies equally to all of his all of humanity. The Lord gives us what we need when we need it to sustain our lives. Yet, Yes, there are those who suffer and die from deprivation, yet we can be sure that God will provide all we need until his purpose for us is, in, is complete. Most people look at all of this as simply the natural, the natural order of things, but it is not natural. It is by God's faithful, loving, and continual work that we live and we continue to live in this world as long as he sees fit to keep us here. It is easy to acknowledge God's miraculous works and thank him for them. Yet miracles by definition are rare events. God's provisional works, on the other hand, are present and ongoing and just as much divine works. Together they give ample evidence of the wisdom of our creator and ample reason to prompt ourselves to praise the Lord. Questions. One. How does Psalm 104 relate to Genesis 1? Two, what does it mean to bless the Lord? Psalms 104, 1. Three, what royal imagery is used to picture the greatness of God? Four, how does the mention of angels in verse 4 exalt God's greatness? According to verse 24, what attribute of God is revealed by his works? 6. To what does the term riches refer? 7. What is the one man-made thing the psalmist mentioned? Why did he do so? 8. What is providence? How is God's providence revealed? 9. How does the providence of God relate to our lives? 10. Is God continually creating new life? Verse 30. Explain. This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, January 22nd, 2017. Thank you for listening. God bless.